All right, so last time we started talking about Hermitian operators, and we said, what's the a, what's a definition of a Hermitian operator? Operator A, we say, is Hermitian if the integral of uh, F star A hat G D tau, where F and G are arbitrary functions, and integration over D tau means integration over all space, uh, is equal to what? the integral that you get if you switch f and g, so it's going to be g star a hat f d tau, but you have to take the complex conjugate after you do the switch. Okay? So, or we also introduce the bracket notation, which basically says, which we can write as f a hat g in brackets must be equal to g a hat f in brackets and then star outside, okay? So, uh, let's prove that operator A as defined here is not Hermitian, okay? So, let's do that. So, what do we do? Well, basically we just need to ask ourselves, is f star A hat G D tau equal to integral of what do I have here? G star A hat F D tau. Okay? Star on the outside. Or if I don't want to have to deal with star, I could actually just switch these two. I can say A F star, right? A hat F star G. G star star is G. And this is, this is just multiplication, so I can switch. It's commutative. Okay? So, uh, in other words, you could write this as a hat g, uh, a hat f g. Okay? So, let's see. Let's prove that that is, in fact, not the case here. So let's start off with this one. Okay. So what's our definition of a hat in this case? Operator A takes the derivative of the function with respect to x. So we're just going to go integral of f star, derivative of g with respect to x. And our d tau is going to be dx from negative infinity to infinity, assuming all possible x values, okay? And at this point, we're going to do, to do a little calculus review. What's integral of u dv uh, integration by parts? This is equal to uv minus integral of v du. Remember that? Differential of a product is equal to the first times the derivative of the second plus the second times the derivative of the first. Okay. So if I want to solve for u dv, and shift over to the left, and then that becomes my integration by parts formula. Okay. So, oops. Uh, what do we have here? We're going to let u equal to f star. And we're going to let dv equal to dg dx dx. Okay. And basically, we're saying dv is equal to dg, right? So du, we say, is df star dx times dx. Got it? And V, did I start recording? Okay, and, and V is just equal to G. Uh, v is equal to G. Okay? So, what would that give me? So 
let's go bring this one down here. So that's equal to uv, u times v, f star g, evaluated from negative infinity to infinity, okay, minus integral of v du, what's v du? g times df star dx dx, okay, from negative infinity to infinity. You got it? But since f and g are well behaved, okay, so f and g will go to zero as x approaches plus or minus infinity. These are well behaved functions. Okay, so this term right here is just zero. Okay, so this just gives me negative, okay, integral of g and derivative of f star with respect to x is just derivative of f with respect to x star, okay to be able to show that, okay? You're taking complex conjugate of a derivative. Taking a derivative and taking the complex conjugate are, is a commutative pair of operators, okay? So you can take the complex conjugate first and then take the derivative, or you can take the derivative and take the complex conjugate to get the same result, okay? So this is from negative infinity to infinity dx. But what is this? This is negative infinity to infinity g. This is a hat f star dx, right? This is the derivative of f with respect to x is a hat f. So this is equal to negative integral of g a f star d tau. Okay? Or I can write that as negative a f star g d tau. How does that compare to what we have before? It's not the same. It's negative. So it's not our mission. Okay? Therefore, A is not Hermitian because this should have because of this negative term. So therefore, operator A is not Hermitian. Okay. Uh, you'll notice in the next couple of slides that what I'm going, what the video here is going to be different from what what happened in the classroom because I made a mistake there. So I'm replacing that segment of the video, the original video, with this corrected one. Okay. So at this point, we wanted to show that i a hat is a linear operator and we've already shown that a hat itself if a hat uh, is a derivative operator it takes a derivative of a function we've already shown that integral of f star a hat g d tau is equal to the negative of a hat f d g a hat f complex conjugate okay g d tau right and so if not if it weren't for this negative sign right here a would have been a hermitian operator but because of that negative sign we say that a hat the derivative operator is not hermitian so we're going to prove now that this operator right here i a hat is a linear operator so I a hat simply means, if you apply that on a function, you take the derivative of the function with respect to x and then multiply by i. Okay? So, let's show that that is in fact equal to, and the way you show something is Hermitian, is you move the operator inside the bra, in front of the function, in the, operate it on the function in the bra. So, I'm going to say that's going to be I a hat operating on function f. 
star the whole thing and then times g integrate over all spells. Okay, so this is what we need to show. And this is actually pretty simple because you can realize that i is a constant and this bracket is nothing more than an integral. So we can move this constant out of our integral. So i, that becomes i f a hat g. Okay. And we've already shown what this is earlier. It's negative of integral of a f star g d tau. So this is negative i times negative of, I can move this thing over here, a hat f g. Okay? And so we can rewrite this as negative i integral of a f star g d tau. But uh, what is I, negative i? You know that negative i is just i star. Okay? I can move that back into the integral. Let me rewrite this. It's negative i integral of a, a hat f star g d tau. So I'm going to move my i inside. So this becomes integral of i, negative i, which is i star. I'm going to call that i star now. So I star times A hat F star G D tau, which is just, well, I can move my I inside the parentheses in front of this A F function right here. But since I already have a star outside the parentheses, if I move it inside, that becomes I star star, so that this becomes an I. So it's going to be integral of I A hat F star G D tau. But that is just the same thing as bracket I A hat F. Okay. Inside with I A hat F inside the bra because of that star right there means the i a f is in the bra and then g in the cat okay so that is that one so we've just proven that i a hat is a hermitian operator so for your homework i need you to show that a squared is a hermitian operator and um, something that just to get you started it's important for you to realize that a squared is really a hat times a so what you can do is you do something like this okay you need to show that that's the same thing as a hat f a hat squared f right G. so how are you going to do that well, uh, here's something to get you started. What you can do is you can apply a hat on g, okay? Remember this bar right here, this thing right here, you can take it on and off. So this becomes f a hat a hat g, okay? Now you know that a hat is a Hermitian op. It's not a Hermitian operator, but so you know. But you know what happens if you switch, switch it around. It becomes it gives you a negative of the, uh, the negative of what you might expect for a Hermitian operator. Okay, so if you did that, so let me just give you step two. So we have fewer steps to worry about. If I were to move this one over here, I already know that I've already shown that if I did that. A hat F, A hat G, that I have to put a negative sign because A hat is not a Hermitian operator. Okay, so find a way to get from there to there. Okay. For the next slide, okay, you have to prove that a multiplicative operator is Hermitian. Uh, let's make that correction. It has to be a real multiplicative operator. Because if you have, for example, f i hat g, where i is just a multiplicative operator, OK? 
okay then what happens if you move the i outside that's i f g okay uh, let's just do that with the integral if i did the uh, integral there integral of f star i g b tau i can move up my i that becomes i f star g b tau okay now if i want my i operating on f what, what what would i have to do i have to move it back in in front of the f so i will have to call that i star star is i f star g b tau okay i star star is i and so this will allow me to combine, that gives me the i and the f, i star f star g b tau, okay, which is the same thing as negative i f star g b tau, okay. And so I can pull, pull out my negative 1, so that's negative of i f star g tau. So that is that's negative of i f g, which is not correct, which is not, which means that i is not on the okay. So keep in mind moving things in out of the bra. If you put something inside the bra, you put a star on it, you take something out of the bra, you have to remove a star from it. So this one, you say the i operator, if all it does is multiply the function by i, is not a Hermitian operator. And that's kind of the reason why if you multiply i and a together, those two negatives that come out cancel each other out. That's why i a hat is a Hermitian operator. But in general, if you have a re multiplicative operator that's just real, okay? So the operator itself is not, its complex conjugate is the same, then you should be able to show that that is Hermitian. Okay. So what are the characteristics of a Hermitian operator? Why are we interested in it? First of all, we're going to postulate that Hermitian operators represent uh, give us a way to extract values of properties for the system. And those properties must be real numbers, okay? So the nice thing about Hermitian operators is they have real eigenvalues. So that means we can postulate that the, the values that we can get if we make measurements are eigenvalues of a Hermitian operator. Okay, so we don't want our theory to give us complex number for something that's real. Uh, and, yeah, I, okay. We don't want to, it to give us a complex number that has an imaginary component. You want, you want real num I understand real numbers, real num complex, real numbers are complex numbers, a subset of complex numbers. Yeah, you're right. But what I meant was you want to make sure that your eigenvalues are real. Okay, so if, so if, you know, if, if, like I said, you know, if you have a complex number, okay, when can it be real? When can z be equal to z star? Well, what is z star? A minus bi. So z is equal to z star if the imaginary component is zero. So in other words, you have a real number. OK? All right. Now, we're also going to talk about Hermitian operators having a complete orthonormal set. We're going to go through that in the next few slides. And then, Sometime later, we're going to talk about Hermitian operators, okay, consequences of Hermitian operators commuting and not commuting, and we're going to get to that uh, later. Okay, so for now, let's just look at the fact that uh, Hermitian operators have real eigenvalues, okay? So let's, here's the proof that uh, Hermitian operators have real eigenvalues. So let's say f is an eigenfunction of a, operator a. Okay, and the eigenvalue is a. What does this mean? If I were to write a hat f, what do I get? I get back uh, the cons, the, the original function, the eigenfunction f, and then I get multiplied by the eigenvalue, which is a constant, right? That's what that means. 
So what happens if A is Hermitian? Well, let's examine what happens if you take this integral right here. Integral of F star A hat F D tau, which I'm writing here in bracket notation, okay? Since A is Hermitian, that means I can switch F and F, okay? And put a star outside, right? So this is a definition of Hermitian operator. And so if that's the case, what, do I, what did I do here? I, I look at the left side here. A hat operating on F. I just took out that thing right there. So I just combined them. Okay. And what is this? Same thing we showed before. This thing is the same thing as this, right? Get rid of that one. So if I have F. A hat F star. That's the same thing as if I were to put the A. Uh, this is true that if I do this, I can say F A hat F star. And remember, if I switch these two now, I just get one. A hat F F star star. And star star cancels out, right? So now that's really that you can actually think of that as, as another way of defining a Hermitian operator. So both of these are really definitions of Hermitian operator. Okay. So if that's the case, what happens to the left side? F. What's a hat up applied on F? It gives you a little a times f, where a is the eigenvalue, right? But what is a hat applied on f? Also little a times f. Okay, so let's write this in standard integral form. Integral of f star, let's do this one on the left, little a, okay, times the F D tau. What do we have on the right side? Oh, yeah. And what do we have on the right side? Integral of AF. Since AF is in the bra, the whole thing, AF has a star. It's complex conjugate, right? So this right here must have a star. Okay. Times F. That's your F D tau. Okay, so what can we do now? A is a constant. What can you do to a constant in an integral? You can pull it out of the integral. So A F star F D tau must be equal to what is A F star? That's just A star F star. But A star is also just another constant, so I, I can also pull that out of the integral, right? So I can say A star integral of F star F D tau. Okay? So A must be equal to A star. Unless F is zero everywhere, in which case that integral is zero. In general, then A is going to be equal to A star. And we're not interested in functions that are zero everywhere anyway. So A is equal to A star, therefore A is real. Okay. Let's talk about an orthonormal set of functions. Let's say you have a set of functions, F1, F2, F3, and so on. We say it's an orthonormal set, okay? If each function is normalized, what does it mean when each function is normalized? Like if I were to ask you, what is the integral of f1 star f1 d tau if f1 is normalized? Equal to 1. Well, that's what it means. What's the integral of f5 star f5 d tau? Oops. f5 star f5 d tau. 1. That's what normalized means. Then we can say the function is also, uh, uh, we say it's orthonormal if each function is orthogonal to all the other functions in that set. 
Okay, what does that, what does ortho, orthogonal mean? Orthogonal means, like if I took a pair of functions, f1 star f2, okay, b tau, if I did that integral, then that is equal to zero if f1 and f2 are orthogonal. Okay, so that's what orthogonal means. The integral of the first function star times the second function over all space is equal to zero if the two functions are orthogonal. Okay, so the whole set, we say, is orthonormal if these are, if the functions in the set obey these conditions. Each one is normalized, each one is orthogonal to all the others. We can summarize all of this by saying this one right here. Okay, integral of f sub i, and i and j can be any number, like 1, 2, 3, 4, right there, any index right there. Okay, so you say integral of f sub i star f j d tau must be equal to 0 if i is not the same as j, okay, or 1 if i and j are the same, okay. And this expression right here has a special symbol. You call that the delta ij. Okay, this is known as the Kronecker delta. So that symbol delta sub ij means that's equal to 0 if i is not equal to j, as equal to 1 if i is equal to j. You can also abbreviate that simply using with direct bracket notation. This one right here is just f sub i in the bra, f sub j in the cat. Okay? The function that starred goes in the bra, and then the other function goes in the cat. Or, if you're really lazy, you can just say i, j. If you know, if you know what function you're referring to, you already know what the functions are, then you can just say, that's another abbreviation. So you see three different ways of abbreviating that integral right there, provided you know what those functions are. Okay? All right, so let's just do a quick check. Let's say functions f1, f2, and so on is an orthonormal set. Which of these is equal to zero? Okay. That means integral of f1 star f2 d tau is here. Okay, what about this one? That's equal to 1. That's i equal to j, right? So that's integral of f3 star f3 d tau. That's equal to 1. So that's a normalized function. f3 is a normalized function. f1 and f2, we say, are orthogonal to each other. Okay, so it's just, that's the expression you, you, you use. You say function f1 and function f2 are orthogonal to each other. Okay, which of these is correct? The first one or the second one? Which one? Huh? The first one's correct. F4 star F5. So if it's an orthonormal set, okay, if you have two different functions in your integral, then your integral is zero. How about the second one? That should be equal to zero. We say f7 and f5 are orthogonal to each other. Okay, let's define what a complete orthonormal set is. Okay, so we have, a, if we have a set of functions, we say that set is a complete orthonormal set if, okay, any function that obeys the same boundary conditions is equal to a linear combination of the functions in the set. Okay, so what do we mean by obeying the same boundary conditions? Uh, let's say you have a set of functions, okay? Let's say all your functions go to zero when x equals, let's say, x equals two. And this is your plot of your function. Um, oops. Okay, let's see. So let's say when x equals two, this for example, okay? Let's say all your functions go to zero. 
So this might be F1, this might be F2, F3 might go this way. And they all obey the same boundary conditions. Okay, and maybe some other condition over here. Oops. Another part here, they all go to zero there as well. So those are what you call boundary conditions. Okay, so uh, if you have a function that follows the same boundary conditions as your orthonormal set, okay, so let's say G, okay, let's say function G obeys the same boundary conditions, then you should be able to write G as C1 F1 plus C2 F2 plus C3 F3 and so on. What do you call that? Constant times function 1 plus constant times function 2 plus constant times function 3. You call that a linear combination of functions F1, F2, and F3, right? So this is a linear combination of F1, F2, F3, and so on. So any function, any other function, okay, that may not be in that set, that may not be part of that orthonormal set, but if that function obeys the same boundary conditions as the functions in the set, you can write it as a linear combination of the functions in the set. So, and you can in fact show that the coefficients are equal, is equal to that, and, and the integral of g star g d tau is just the sum of the squares of the coefficients. Let's show that, okay? Uh, let me see if I did that. That's okay. So let's just make it, let's make it simple. Let's just say, let's say g, okay, so g is, uh, right. let's take this integral right here, okay? What is the integral of f? Uh, let's make that, let's make it simple. Let's say F3 star G. What would that be? D tau. Just for example. Then it's going to be what? Integral of F star. What is G? C1 F1 plus C2 F2 plus C3 F3 plus and so on. D tau, right? Okay. And what would that be equal to? Integral of F1, uh, F3, right? F3 star C1 F1 d tau, right? Plus integral of F3 star, so I just distribute, right? F3 star C3, C2 F2 d tau, plus integral of F3 star C3 F3 D tau plus something else, right? Or in bracket notation, I can say this is F3 C1 F1, right? Plus, this is going to be F3 C2 F2. And this is going to be F3 C3 F3, right? So what can I do at this point? What can I do with my constants in my integral? This one. I can pull that out of my integral, right? So this will just give me C1, F3, F1, right? Plus C2, F3, F2. Plus C3, F3, F3 plus, and so on and so forth. Right. Well, what happens now? What is F3, F1? Zero. Why? They are, what's the word? Orthogonal. Okay. F3 and F1 are orthogonal to each other. What is F3, F2? Also zero. They are orthogonal to each other. What is F3, F3? This is 1 because we say F3 is normalized. Each and every function in your set is normalized, right? So what, what do you think these extra additional terms are going to be? 0 because F3, we say, is orthogonal to all the other functions. So what's the only, what's the only constant that's left? C3. So we've shown that C3 is equal to F3 star G d tau. 
Okay, in general, C sub i would be integral of F sub i star G beta. And that's what we just, that's what we're saying right here. Okay? Yes, okay. Now, can you show this one? Let me get you started, and that will be homework number three for today. Okay, this one right here says what? Integral of C1, F1, plus C2, F2, plus, and so on and so forth, right? Time, a star, right? So that's your G, and the other G, and there's a star there, and the other G is also C1, F1, plus C2, F2, plus so on and so forth, B, tau. Okay? So, uh, you can just do, you can just, uh, for, to make things easy for you, let's just use two terms, okay? Uh, it, if you use two ter terms, I want you to show for your homework that this is in fact equal to absolute value of C1 squared plus absolute value of C2 squared plus absolute value of C3 squared and so on, okay? Absolute value of C3 squared and so on. But if you only use two terms, then you'll only get C1 squared and C2 squared. So that's what this means right here, summation of C sub i squared. Okay, so uh, that should be an easy proof. All you have to do is foil it, right? So, this one, okay, this one, this one, and now. You just do, ju just do the first two for each one. So I'll just give, just get, give me four terms. Okay, huh? I'm sorry? You just expand all of this, and then you should get C1 squared plus C2 squared. And then this is going to be, if we leave out, all right. So, let's apply what we just learned. Suppose F1, F2, and so on is an orthonormal set, and G obeys the same boundary conditions and g happens to be equal to 2f1 plus 3f2 what's the what is this integral equal to f2 star g is c2 what is c2 3 okay let's try this one so let's say f1 f2 and so on it forms an orthonormal set if G obeys the same boundary condition and happens to be equal to 2F1 plus 3F2, what is this integral equal to? So integral of G star G D tau is equal to C1 squared plus C2 squared plus C3 squared plus and so on. What is C1? C1 is 2, 2 squared. C2 is 3, so absolute value of 3 squared. And C3 is what? 0. What is C4? 0. Everything else is 0, right? So that gives you 4 plus 9, 13. So is G normalized? No. How do I normalize G? So if I were to define, uh, let's say, K as a normalized function of G, what is my N? Square root of 13. Very good. You still remember. Okay? If K is normalized. So it's just 1 over the sum of the c squares. 1 over the square root of the sum of the c squares. Oh, 
Now, what's the question? The <laughs> next question. I, I got ahead of myself. Okay? So, how do we solve this? You're going to say then that absolute value of 2n squared plus absolute value of 3n squared must be equal to 1 if g is normalized. Right? So, what is n? So, 4 times absolute value of n squared plus 9 times absolute value of n squared is equal to 1. Okay. So, n squared times 13 is equal to 1. Absolute value of n squared is 1 over 13. Absolute value of n is 1 over squared of 13. Okay. Now let go, let's go to postulate to do, what time is it now? Okay, we got time. All right, so now we can go to postulate two, which says that, and postulate three, for every property of a system, there corresponds an operator, which must be her mission, okay? So there's an operator, if there's a property of a system, there is an operator corresponding to it, which must be her mission. If the property is measured, okay, we're going to postulate that the only possible outcomes are the eigenvalues of the operator. Okay? And like I said, we want her mission. So here it is the reason now why we want it to be her mission. The reason the operator must be her mission is we, we've already proven that her mission operators have real eigenvalues. And we are going to postulate that so when we postulate, I mean, we're going to assume, okay, that the only outcomes of any measurement will be eigenvalues of that operator. So, what are these operators? Quantum mechanical operators corresponding to position are just multiplicative operators, which multiply by the function by the coordinate. So let's say... If you're going to define x1, y1, and z1 as the coordinates of particle 1, then, okay, the operator, x1 hat, simply multiplies whatever function it operates on by x1. It's a multiplicative operator. Okay? So what would be the expression for the operator that corresponds to the y-coordinate of, let's say, particle number 3. y-coordinate of particle number 3 is y3, right? y sub 3. So to define the operator, you're going to say, then y3 hat, if it were to operate on a function, it will just give me back y3 times the function. Okay, so you say y3 hat is a multiplicative operator. Now, let's look at linear momentum operators, okay? The quantum mechanical operator that corresponds to the x-axis component of the momentum, that is P sub x, right, of particle 1, transforms any arbitrary function as follows. So this is the operator for the x component of the momentum of particle 1. What is momentum? Mass times velocity, right? So the momentum P sub x is mass times velocity along the x axis, okay? So if you're dealing with multiple particles, then you have to specify which particle you're dealing with. So let's just put a 1 there. I mean, if you emphasize with, with one particle 1, there might be other particles in that case. Okay, so Px1 hat operating on the function. This is what it does to the function. It takes the derivative of the function with respect to x1 and then multiplies it by h bar over i. Okay? h bar is just Planck's constant divided by 2 pi. Okay? And i, of course, is just squared of negative 1. Note that this is, this is a Hermitian operator. Remember we said the derivative operator is not Hermitian, but if you multiply it by i, it becomes Hermitian. That's why you have that i there. Okay, so that this this i in this expression makes this overall uh, operator a Hermitian operator. So that is the operator for momentum. That is you need something. That's something you have to memorize. Okay, h bar over i derivative with respect to the coordinate. 
So h bar over i times the derivative with respect to whatever component, x, y, z, or whatever. Okay? Uh, one uh, memory aid I used to remember that is Heider. Okay. Hi. Hi. Der. Derivative. So, what would be the expression that defines the operator corresponding to the z axis component? Okay. So, z axis component of the momentum. So, P sub z of particle number two, so z2. Okay. So, what's that operator going to be equal to? If I operate that on a function, what do I get? I, I take the derivative of the function with respect to x2, I mean z2, okay? And notice it's a partial derivative because your function may be a function of more than one variable with respect to z2 times after you get the, deriv the partial derivative, you multiply by h bar and you divide by i. Okay, so that is the momentum operator along the z axis for particle number two. Okay, kinetic energy operator. Kinetic quantum mechanical operator corresponding to kinetic energy is given by this expression right here. Uh, kinetic energy, or you can say K, one I think your book uses K. What's K? One half mv squared, right? And uh, if I multiply that by v over, uh, by m over m, still the same, right? And so that's one half m squared d squared over m, right? And you can see, so that's in classical mechanics. And that's just going to be, what's mv squared? That's just p squared. So this is going to be p squared over 2m. In other words, what we're really saying is, okay, we know what p is, right? So let's just say our, our, uh, our, our particle just moves along one dimension. So you can just say then that t hat is just p hat p hat, that's p squared, divided by t. Okay, so this is a kinetic energy operator. So what would this be? If we were to apply t hat on a function, what would we do? p hat, p hat over 2m applied on a function. Up. p hat, p hat, so that's p squared, right? Applied on a function, okay? So what is p hat applied on a function? h bar over i, derivative of the function with respect to, let's just use the full derivative. Let's just assume we have one dimension, one variable. So a derivative of f with respect to x, right? And we're still going to apply p hat on that one and divide it by 2x, right? So, what do we get now? I can pull this out of my integral, right? Out of my derivative. Uh, that's a constant. P hat is a linear operator. I can pull that out of a linear operator. So that's going to be h bar over i. And P hat is what? P hat is h bar over i derivative with respect to x of this one right here, df dx, right? That goes in there. And the whole thing is divided by 2m, right? You can have that 2m. Okay. So what do I get? h bar squared over i squared, right? Times 2m. I'll factor out all the constants, okay? And what, what do I have here? That's just the second derivative with respect to x of x. Okay, so that's, what's i squared? Negative 1, so that's negative h bar squared over 2m, second derivative with respect to x of whatever function you're operating on. So this is your t hat operator 
This is for mo due to motion along the x-axis. Okay? One-dimensional problem. And if you have uh, multi-particles, then you may have to specify which particle, one, two, or two. Due to motion of particle one, then you'd have to say, okay, then if you have, okay, due to motion of particle one, and you use partial derivatives if your, if your particle can move along the x, y, and z axis. So this is just the part of the kinetic energy operator that deals with motion along the x axis for particle one, okay? So notice this is negative h bar squared over 2m1, that's mass of particle one, okay? If you have another particle, then you have to use the mass of the other particle for that operator for that particle. With respect, and you have the second derivative with respect to x1. So that's a kinetic energy operator. So, what would be the operator that corresponds to the total kinetic energy of particle number two? Well, total kinetic energy would be what? Total kinetic energy would be p squared over 2m, right? But we're dealing three dimensions here. We're dealing with three dimensions. So what's the square of a momentum vector? P sub x squared plus P sub y squared plus P sub z squared, right? Divided by 2m. So that's the classical expression. So in quantum mechanics, what do we say? The kinetic energy operator is equal to P x squared over 2m is what? Negative h bar squared over 2m and this is particle number two, so I'm going to call that M2. Okay. Second derivative with respect to X2. Okay. And that's PX squared over, so this is your T sub X2. Plus negative H bar squared over two times mass of particle number two times second derivative with respect to Y2. So this is Ty for particle 2, plus negative h bar squared over 2 times mass of particle 2, second derivative with respect to z2. Okay? So that's your kinetic energy operator, just for particle number 2. So this is T sub z for particle number 2. Okay, we can simplify this. We can factor out negative h bar squared over 2 times mass of 2. What do I have inside? Second derivative with respect to x2 plus second derivative with respect to y2. <coughs> Sorry. Plus second derivative with respect to z2. Okay, this expression right here is called, you can abbreviate that by an inverted triangle. This is called the del squared operator. Del squared, okay. So whenever you write del squared, and this is del squared for particle number two. So I'm going to put a label there that says two, okay. So a sum of second derivatives along the x, y, and z axis is called the del squared operator. You got it? No, I have it right there. Del squared or Laplacian. Okay, so del squared for particle i it's just the derivative with respect to x sub i, second derivative, plus the second derivative with respect to y sub i, plus the second derivative with respect to z sub i. Note that each of these can be thought of as an operator. So it's, a, it's like operator A plus operator B plus operator C, right? So you can just distribute that. So that applies to that function, that applies to that function, that applies to that Okay. So this is going to be AF plus BF plus CF.
Okay, so what's the expression that defines the operator corresponding to the total kinetic energy of the nucleus and three electrons of a lithium atom? So you have a nucleus, let's call that N, and electron one, so, and you get electron two, and you get another electron, electron three. Lithium atom has three electrons, right? And a nucleus. So what's the total kinetic energy? Total kinetic energy is just equal to kinetic energy of particle one, uh, which is the nuclear, uh, kinetic energy of the nucleus plus kinetic energy of electron one plus kinetic energy of electron two plus kinetic energy of electron three, okay? If I were to expand this, what's kinetic energy of the nucleus? Negative h bar squared over two times the mass of the nucleus, del squared for the nucleus, right? What is the kinetic energy for particle one? Negative h bar squared over two times the mass of an electron. Okay, you have the three electrons. So, no, this is mass of the nucleus. This is mass of the electron. Okay, times del squared for electron one. Right, and then you do the same thing for electron two and electron three. You can just factor it out. Plus del squared for electron two, plus del squared for electron three. So you can see this. Expression can get really hairy. It can get really wrong. No, because those are separate, different things. This is with respect to the coordinates of x1. This one is with respect to coordinates of x2, and that's coordinates of x2. Okay? So that is the total kinetic energy of a lithium atom. 